in terms of our skills, um, well, if the vision letter is, is, is self-evident. There's ways that those skills are imparted and the ways that they're put to work. But uh, our gifts, e e Ephesians 4, advance the slide for me, please, John. I don't know why my slide decks seem to have a lot of time to lay in them, but it's a pretty simple deck, I thought. And it's going to think about it a while. But if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, we can actually start there. Um, Andrew had the reading for us, and I want to go back and visit um, that the, the, the context here talks about us being worthy of the calling, talks about the uh, idea of preserving or being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This comes from the fact that there is just one God, that there is just one body. There's just one faith. There is one baptism. There's one originator from whom all gifts issue to each according to his calling. Not according to his ability. Not according to his motivation. But according to his calling. Now, the calling, I, I've given lessons on this idea of the calling. And that is in reference, in my mind at least, to the idea that God had a plan for all of us that was established before the foundations of the earth. And our calling is to fulfill that plan. It's not a measure of our own strength and ability, but it's according to God's genera generous generosity, that word will come out, who gives liberally to all. God the Father, verse 6, who is over all, and through all, and in all, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So there is the idea that the grace was given to each of us, so that's inclusive, that doesn't exclude anyone, that's all of us. And there's the idea of, in verse 7, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So what's the measure of Christ's gift? And that's when Paul in the letter to the Ephesians launches into, or refers back to, I should say at least, a reference in Psalms chapter 68. He says in Ephesians 4, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Let's jump over to... Uh, 1 Peter 4, real quick, before we go look at that text. First Peter chapter 4 says, uh, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. This seems to be in the same thinking, the same manner of thinking, although it's a different author here, as what's said in terms of the gift was given to each one of us, a gift of grace. Now, in verse 7, it's according to Christ's measure, there's a sense in which every gift is grace, right? Because gifts are things that aren't earned. So you can think of, well, the grace of God means God's ability to have a forgiving spirit. When, God's, when God issues grace, it is unmerited favor. So that can take a lot of forms. But in every respect, every gift, whether it's us giving a gift or us receiving a gift, every earthly gift is also a gift of grace. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a gift. It would be by compensation or something that's been earned or something that's due. And there's other passages that, that go into that conversation. But a gift is that which has not been worked for. A gift is that which is not earned. Let's jump back to uh, 
Psalms now. Psalms chapter 68. That idea of giving gifts to men is uh, in the context here. Psalms chapter 68. I don't, know any, I don't know any better way to do this than to just start laying out the picture here that's painted. So this is a scene, and I think allegory is the white word. I think that's a mind picture. I hope I'm using that correctly. And it's a mind picture that, that David paints. I have to think this psalm is written... At some point in David's life when things have calmed down a little bit. And by that I mean I suspect he's probably king of Israel when he puts this to, to paper. But let's remember some of King David's history a little bit. King David was, a, before he was king, was a, an adversary to the king of Israel. Saul sought to take his life. David was pursued. He was uh, chased from village to village, town to town, across the wilderness. He was pursued because of the jealousy of the king. Jealousy used the strength of Israel's own armies to pursue and persecute the one whom the people sang, well, Saul has killed his thousands, but David, our champion, that's a parathetical phrase. David, the champion, he's killed ten thousands. He was a darling because of his prowess on the battlefield. And as one who was pursued, the fighting didn't stop. David had men with him that were trusted, loyal soldiers who had joined in his fight against the king. It was, it was an unrighteous persecution of this warrior, of this one who was devoted to God and devoted to the betterment of the kingdom of Israel. And there were many men that would swear allegiance to him rather than to Saul because they acknowledged that, that fervor on David's part to serve God, to pursue God's enemies, to destroy God's enemies, and to bring all the nations surrounding Israel into subjection to the one true Israel that God had established. Now you think about the, the character of people that would say, we got a sworn king. In fact, Jehovah God, through his prophet, had anointed this king. But I'm going to give my allegiance to another. And that takes a little bit of moxie might be the right word. That takes some guts to do that. So this band is out there. This, this, these traveling soldiers are surrounding David, providing protection, helping him in the wilderness, helping him defend himself against the armies of Saul. They do so out of loyalty. They do so out of trust in the one that's leading them. David knows what it is to be a warrior. And he knows what it is to be a champion. And he writes this psalm. And he writes this psalm. And in this psalm, you get, you get a flavor of the relationship between the, the, the warrior king that's referenced here and his subjects. And a couple examples of that. I think it's, I forgot where it is. I think it's all the way down to verse 18 before there's a reference to that which was repeated in Ephesians. But as you look at Psalm 68, you get verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. And let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so dry them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish before God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them exalt before God. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness. Sing to God. Sing praises to His name. Cast up a highway for Him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, and exalt before Him. So you have this warrior. 
It's God. It's Jehovah. But he's put in the he's put in this allegory as one who is a desert fighter. Because his followers say, rise up a highway through the desert. They're making a way, making a, a path of success for this warrior king who's a desert fighter. He is cunning. He looks out for his men. Remember how David defended his men that were loyal to him? How he stood up against those? My men need water for their animals. We need some food. He secured that for his men. We find shelter. We need places to hide. We need places to encamp. We need to ensure that our men are equipped. We need to make sure they're ready for battle. We need to make sure they have the heart to fight. That's the kind of warrior, soon to be king, that David was. And here God is in that same allegorical picture. So it's, it's very easy to insert David in here as he's using the model of how he lived in the desert as one who fought righteously before his anointment, as one who fought valiantly and fought with his men and for his men while he led them. Verse 5, A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Obedience to this God means there's a home. There's a habitation. And there's provision for those who need to prosper. You know, some of the guys that were with David may have had nothing in their hearts but a trust for David as a, as a warrior. They had, they had fought with him. They knew what kind of character he was. Some of them maybe not so pure heart. They may, not had, they may have had other issues as to why they separated their allegiance from King Saul to join David's group. It may have even been subconsciously. And I think, of, I think of those who were Jesus' apostles and those that were Jesus' disciples, and they would discuss among themselves, when Jesus comes into the kingdom, I wonder what kind of place I'm going to have. Am I going to be at the right hand or not? What kind of, what kind of power am I going to wield? Because I fought with Jesus and show myself faithful to him while he established his kingdom. Now, they were thinking on earth, of course, when they had that mind. But I think of, they squabbled amongst themselves, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom that Jesus is going to establish? And I have to wonder if there weren't men in David's camp that did the same thing. Because this king rewards those who are faithful to him. Verse 7, O God, when thou dost go before thy people, when thou dost march through the wilderness, the earth quaked. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou dost shed abroad a plentiful rain, O God. Thou dost confirm thine inheritance when it was parched, the creatures settled in it. Rain's coming. It's, it's dry ground right now. But the rains are coming. And there's going to be bounty. There's going to be plenty. And you're going to be part of it. Because you're part of me. That's the promise that this warrior king is making to his loyal subjects. Okay? Skip over to verse 19. No, not verse 19. Let's skip all the way over to... Verse 28, the Lord, your, excuse me, your God has commanded your strength. Show thyself strong, O God, who has acted on our behalf. Verse 35, O God, thou art awesome from the sanctuary. 
the God of Israel itself, the God of Israel himself gives strength and power to the people. Blessed be God. Now, do you, you have this mind picture now? Of Psalm 68? Do you see what's going on in terms of the relationship between those fighting men who were loyal subjects to God in his desert campaign that's described here? Does it ring a bell historically? Do you see the connection that David's trying to make? And what, is it, what does then the psalmist's letter say in verse 18? Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captive thy captives. I've received gifts among men. Now this is New American Standard. It, it translates received gifts among men. Uh, New American Standard, Andrew reading out the English Standard Version, also reads in the New Covenant, gives gifts to men. And I don't think that's a conflict. Gifts were received among men at the direction of the Lord. What kind of gifts? Gifts are grace. Gifts aren't earned. They're not, they're not compensation. They're not pay. They're not something we can claim. I can't put a lien on it. I don't have any legal right because it's a gift. Okay? And we talked about some of the gifts that David gave. Gifts of sustaining his people. Gifts of providing safety and habitation. A whole range of things that were both promises being fulfilled by those warriors, as well as things that were just completely outside of their control because they were the hands of one they trusted. And Ephesians chapter 4 says, Each one of us, to each one of us, excuse me, verse 7, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. First Peter 4 said those gifts were uh, just as each one had received a gift. It was, it was to be used in serving others as to be good stewards of the varied grace of God. Going back to 1 Peter 4, I'm probably nowhere close to my slide deck. You can give that a spin. Uh, you can pass that one. You can pass that one. Oh, let's, let's go back. I'm sorry. Let's stay here. All right. So, according to the measure of Christ, it's hard to put any kind of uh, cap on the measure of the gifts of grace. If I'm in the kitchen and I'm supposed to have two cups of flour, I'm supposed to scoop my cup. I guess I'm supposed to sift it too at some point. And then, I, you know, scrape a knife across the cup. Robin's laughing at me. She says, how's he ever baking anything? He doesn't know what he's doing. Scrape a knife across the cup. And you got a cup and you dump it in a bowl and you scrape and you dump. But Christ is not using the cup measure. His gifts are overflowing. They're abounding. And, and God's gifts are according to our ability to ask. May I have another cup of flour, please? Absolutely. May I have another cup of flour? Yes, you may. Yes, you may. And there's another one after that if you ask for it. This warrior king, Jehovah, had the trust of his men, but he also had put his trust in his men to be faithful. And he promised them more than they can imagine. Our prayers are to ask for things above our ability to imagine God's ability to fulfill. 
We're encouraged to pray that way. Now, why would we be encouraged to pray like that if it wasn't true? That'd be a mockery, wouldn't it? It'd be a cruel joke, and it's not a funny one. To be encouraged to pray beyond what we can imagine? That tells me God intends to fulfill promises like that, prayers like that. Getting back into Ephesians, I hope we've got a good capture in our mind of the gifts. I know, uh, I know Jeff and I, we were discussing this briefly. He, talked, he really keyed in on one piece I haven't mentioned. He led captive a host of captives. Like I said, some of these guys following David probably, probably had a past. A couple of them did. They may have been enslaved. They may have been runaways, even. They might have had some beef with the king of Israel, the, the appointed king, the anointed king. And they were more than happy to see a change in headship. And they'd been happy to help David accomplish that. And I think David uses that in his uh, illustration, too. But it's used, well, it is used as illustration. But we're prisoners of a different kind. We're prisoners of sin. We're prisoners of death. The God is able to lead captive a host of captives. So God takes our heart. God takes our allegiance. God takes our commitment our love to Him. And He captures us with it. We become slaves to Him rather than slaves to disobedience. And so God leaves, leads host. He's ahead of, He is over this collection of prisoners. And He does that from a standpoint of authority. Okay? God can take us captive because He owns all of creation. So He's well within His rights to take us captive, to take us prisoner. But in doing so, we're released from the former bonds that we had. Those men that fought with David, maybe runaways, maybe... Maybe they were under consideration or pursuit by the king of Israel in another fashion. But they were free from those things. He gave us, it says in verse 11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, Pastors, shepherds, teachers. So in the, in the allegory, we not only get to be recipients of the gifts, but we also get to be the gift that is given to the church. In this, in this picture that Paul with David's help, have painted. We have roles, we have people who fulfill roles that not only are the recipients of the grace of God to be equipped to do the things they need to do, but are themselves, in fact, the hands and feet of the gifts to the church. So it's a dual, a duality. There's a dual fulfillment here of that kind of discussion. Next slide, maybe. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, it says in verse 12. The equipping of the saints for the work of service in the New American Standard. I copied all my stuff out of the ESV, and then I forgot my ESV, so I'm reading New American Standard in front of me here. But that way I get two good translations. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. 
to the building up the body of Christ. Sounds a lot like verse 3 again, doesn't it? Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and the oneness that is in God's people. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I have to break that verse down a little bit. The, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we're working to attain. And we're not going to get there based upon our own strength, our own abilities, our own ideas. And that's why we need the gifts of God. Because I am, I am not equipped to be a mature leader in the church of God's people. I'm not. I've been gifted to do that work. But I need so much help in doing that because it's not of me. I've been calling Jeff now my partner in crime. We get together and we talk and we enjoy each other. And we both talk about the tremendous responsibility and how neither one of us are fit for the job. Because we're not. What we have are gifts of God that we have to deploy as shepherds. And we can't do it. We can't do it without you doing your thing. It doesn't work. And we're limited by our own weakness, by our own human judgment, by our own distractions, our own growing weariness. We need to recoup. We need to rest. We need to be restored in the work. And we don't do that without you. But we are the gifts, and we are to be used for the equipping of the saints for the work of service until when? When do we quit? When do we get that, that booty that was back in Psalms? God gave gifts to men. This wasn't just randomness. The power of God is evident in Psalm 68. But who was God giving gifts to? It was those that had fought his battles with him. Those that had been by his side in the warfare of righteousness. And God, or that warrior king, or that allegory, however you want to look at that, it's about, you know, we're hiding in a cave right now. Looking a little bleak, isn't it? There's a death sentence on my head, and yours too by association, because you don't think if they didn't kill David, they weren't going to wipe out that whole band. Don't fool yourself. These men all knew, they all knew, that if their leader was to be captured and, and killed, they were going to be killed too. There was no, not going to be, ah, oh, just get back into the camp of Israel. We'll just overlook the fact you held an open rebellion against the king. We won't remember that. They all knew they were dead men if they weren't successful. Is that motivating? Does that make you, does that make you fight a little harder? It's supposed to. It's the same thing is true of us. If we can't be in God's grace, and we can't receive the gifts that He gives, and we can't deploy them in the unity of peace, 
or I should say the bond of unity, bond of peace. I can't say it. I'll read it. Verse 3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If we can't be deploying God gifts in that work, till when? Till verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of God, fullness of Christ. So when did David's men abandon him in the cave and said, no, I fought long enough. It just doesn't look like we're going around the corner. David, it's been a great run. I wish you the best, but I'm getting out of here. Some may have done that. They might have, I don't know. But had they done that, what would be their place in King David's reign as king of Israel? Where do you think that would have left them? Have we attained yet to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God? Have we matured as a fully matured Christian to where we can say it's time to sit back, it's time to take the spoils, it's time to put ourselves at ease, it's time to be comfortable, it's time to watch other people work. I won't ask for a show of hands. But if you think you got there and you'd like to raise your hand but you're afraid I'd yell at you if you did, just think, um, as long as life's in the body, as long as there was breath, do you think David's men fought valiantly? Because they trusted in their leader. Do you think it's our responsibility also? Has, is there a unity? of the body of, of Christ today? It wasn't three, four weeks ago I had a lesson talking about the church of your choice. There's probably hundreds, if not thousands. That's just within Christianity, by the way, of, of doctrines that have differences that we might identify as, well, that's a separate teaching from another. We don't, don't forget Christianity is a small percentage of the entire world in terms of those who have any kind of religious conviction. And that even in this country, religious conviction is waning before our eyes. Have we attained yet? How do we use the gifts that God has given us? Can we not put ourselves in the, in the mind that I'm, I'm fighting with my king. And my king has to be successful. Because my king doesn't accept anything other than victory. And my king tells all his subjects, all his warriors, you don't accept anything other than victory. So when do I get a quit? There's, there's not really an exit game here. But it, it also makes me think in terms of the gifts that God gives and the way that I think about those gifts. Again, I'm not talking about my abilities. I'm not talking about my talents. I might be able to utilize something God gives me because of some talent that I have developed over time, but that's only because God gave me the time to develop the talent. How do I think about those gifts? They're not for my leisure. They're not for my comfort. They're not for my retirement home. They're not for my own security at the cost of the kingdom of God. When you're sleeping in the cave, or you're not sleeping in the cave, 
Now, I'm going to really weird you out here. I'm going to, and when the centipedes come out of the cold, damp ground of the cave and crawl on you, and when you hear the coyotes at the mouth of the cave communicating with one another, although we think there's something to eat in this cave, why don't you come join us? That's what coyotes do, I think. And when you haven't eaten in a day or two or three, and your water canteen's running pretty low, and that water we found in the cave was nasty. It was dank and yucky. And little blind fish were swimming around in it. When you're at that point in the cave, that's when God gifts me the most when the promises of God mean the most. And it would be real tempting when there's a holiday inn just outside the mouth of the cave and they got a clean bed and hot water in the shower and the breakfast bar opens at 6.30 in the morning. But that's, that's not the attitude to take. God's gifts are not all about we're in the worst of situations. But if you can endure something like that and think, I'm just going to remain loyal to my king, even in the midst of a situation like this, I don't know that any of us have burdens that are that difficult right now. So that means by extension, we should be able to endure them. And we should be able to look at what God has done for us. This morning, well, I, I guess I looked at the weather report, and it was starting to cloud up last night. Yesterday was beautiful, and I got this idea I was going to wash my cars, and I'm not, you know, Juanda's Bob would just be mortified at how filthy my cars are. His cars were always beautiful and well-maintained, and mine are disgusting, and I hadn't washed my Kia since 2022, but I couldn't put a finger on the date. And um, so I hand washed both the cars and I cleaned them all up and I swept them out. And I like to use this product that I put on the windshield and it makes the water beat up so that it runs off the windshield. I actually, thinking of the rains today, I was looking forward to the rain because I like to watch the rain beat on the windshield when I cleaned my car. And today was the gift of God. Let's see, the, let's see the gifts in the rain. As well as the sunshine. And let's be busy about the work of preserving the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I don't know if I got any more slides or not. Let's see. Speaking, rather, the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. I skip verse 14. We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness of deceitful scheming. We get confused. We take our eye off of the important things and we get to dealing with the minutia sometimes. Maybe my lessons are too complex and need to think about the simple things. And the simple things are, we have promises that far, far exceed anything that King David could have given his men. His most faithful, his most trusted right arm Shield bearer, you know, spear carrier, whatever it was that, that David went to battle with, the ones that he said, You're going to get my top shelf rewards when this is over with. I'm going to put you in charge of thousands. You're going to live in a palace like me. You're never going to go hungry in a cave again. All that David could have promised these men. What does that compare to what God has in store for us? Let's not be easily 
tossed to and fro, a lack of conviction, a lack of trust in the things that God has promised. We have each other. We have the teachers. We have the pastors. We have tools. We have gifts that we can use. And we should have lots and lots of motivation to see God's kingdom come to its full, final end when God has saved each and every soul that He can between now and the end of this universe. And we want to be part of that. We want to be part of that. Is there another slide? I don't remember. Yes. This one body, this one hope that we've been talking about. Are you part of that? Are you part of that one body? Find your calling. I don't know in all respects how David was able to assemble the men who were willing to die for him. Do you put posters up? Is that door-to-door -door campaign? I don't know what it looks like. But the calling has been there for us since before time. And find the gifts. God will shower gifts upon us that equip us for the work of service. When I lose my own motivation, I'm not a good cheerleader. Some people are good cheerleaders. I'm not a good cheerleader. When I lose my motivation, I tend to turn inward. I tend to get quiet. And I tend to back off and disengage. And that's not the way to do it. But there are some here who are good cheerleaders. You're good at it. Do we need encouragement? Do we need to be cheering one another on? I need to be a better cheerleader. My wife says, why don't you smile once in a while? And I say, I am smiling. Can't you tell? I want you to join all of us with your gifts. I want all of us to be busy with our calling. If we can help you with your calling this morning, let us know how we can help you as we stand and sing. If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if His care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of His presence is born in your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? If your faith in the Savior is strong, Lord, in the strength of the Lord. If a hope of a is not a oh, you not from the story Yeah.